Audi, Osgrave Royalty here, Justin speaking. How are y'all? Welcome to another video. A lot to cover today. Uh, the boy psychology archetypes. Um, this is our second video aside from the introduction for our King Warrior Magician Lover book series by Robert L. Moore and Douglas Gillette. This section's a bit quote heavy, so I'll be doing a lot of referring to my notes. Please check out the previous entries in the series, as well as the last season, for a more foundational theoretical look at what archetypes are and how they serve mankind's survival. So, I think this might be the first time we, we actually get to talk about very laser-focused, specific archetypes and how they play out in the world. We've talked about the mother archetype and the father archetype and the archetype of the family, the archetype of the initiation, in, in previous videos, and I'd highly recommend all of those. But now we're getting a lot more specific and nuanced. And more in Gillette are writing in a framework of masculine psychology. So this doesn't mean that women can't identify with this. I'd be surprised if they couldn't identify with this because we all have access to all of the archetypes. And men access the feminine archetypes through the anima, and women access the male archetypes through the animus, according to Jungian theory. And next season, we'll be covering Jean Bolin's uh, Goddesses of Every Woman, and I could identify with some of those impulses, um, as it should be. And she also wrote a book called Gods of Every Man. Uh, for the male side. And that's a tangent, but uh, more on that uh, at a later time. So what we're going to be talking about are what Moore and Gillette call boy psychology archetypes, which are the immature versions of the king, warrior, magician, lover. Instead, it'll be the divine child, the precocious child, the edible child, and the hero as um, as the immature versions of each. Those weren't correlated in that sentence. I'll, I'll unpack all that in a moment. I just wanted to list them out. Um, we're also going to talk about, and this is something we'll be talking a lot about in this season, which are what are called shadow inflations or shadow possessions. And it's one of the, well, written rules of all this that if you're not embodying an archetype then you are being possessed by its shadow side to some degree that may sound harsh but when we as we unpack all of this we'll be able to see some examples and it's not pessimistic and it's not cynical to take that stance, in my opinion. What's worse is being in a position when you are unaware of what neurosis or psychological distress is ailing you and it's manifesting in your life. Jung said that what we fail to make conscious will will act out in the world unconsciously and we will call it fate, right? So it's awareness is the key. And these archetypes that we're going to go through along with the mature versions are lenses we can use, are paradigms we can use to focus on our lives and actions and see how we measure up. Now, with that in mind, we'll we'll kind of get into it. So 
Moore says that the archetypes of boy psychology gives rise in a complex way to each of the archetypes of mature masculinity. The boy is father to the man. Thus, the divine child, modulated and enriched by life, life's experiences, becomes the king. The precocious child becomes the magician, the Oedipal child becomes the lover, and the hero becomes the warrior. Yeah, we're going to go through them quickly here. And I'm tired, you know, I'm going to say it over and over again, but I am not an authority on all this. I'm learning this with y'all. I'm an enthusiastic fan. That's how I categorize myself. I think these are some cool ideas. I'm sending up the flare saying, hey, check these out. If you want to know more, you know where to look. But I, I want to be the guy pointing out where things might be. So on the divine child, um, it's the, more and Gillette. Say, and I say more and Gillette. If I say more or more and Gillette, more is easier to say. Credit to both of them all the, all the while. I'm just going to say more <laughs> as much as I can. Just uh, I'm speaking a lot and I want to be efficient. So please forgive me. From the book, they say uh, the the most primal of the immature masculine energy energies is the divine child. And as we'll see, the most fundamental masculine archetype is the king because it creates the space for the other archetypes. And uh, the divine child has some of those characteristics. So they say the divine child archetype that appears in our myths as Orpheus, as Christ, as the infant Moses, and as various figures in the myths of many religions it goes by many names and is evaluated differently by the different schools of psychology, usually condemned by them as something to be disconnected from. The important thing is to see that the divine child is built into us as a primal pattern of the immature masculine. Jungians believe that the divine child is a vital aspect of the archetypal self, capital S self. It is the source of life within us. It possesses magical, empowering qualities, and getting in touch with it produces an enormous sense of well-being, enthusiasm for life, and great peace and joy. Connection with this archetype keeps us from feeling washed up, bored, and unable to see the abundance of human potential all around us. Let that sink in for a moment. <clears throat> when when you don't have a connection with this divine child, with this kind of kingly energy, your world is very small. You don't see many possibilities. You're not very creative, uh, most likely lethargic, bored, he says, they say. It's, it's a very small existence. And See, I have some notes here. When, when the divine child becomes inflated um, or there's a shadow possession going on, in other words, when, the, when a child or, you know, let me, let me rephrase here. These are the immature archetypes, but grown men can remain in these archetypes. I say immature and it's not it's not about age precisely. Although we all the mature masculine has to go through these, but some never leave kind of thing, right? So the divine child is basically the inbuilt impulse the masculine inbuilt impulse to see the richness of existence. If you don't get it if you don't get what you need if this does not get actualized in your upbringing and there's a lot to cover here we're we're going forward with the assumption that your upbringing is going to constellate as the unions would say these archetypes in various individuals that's how these arise and we talked that about that in with the mother archetype and the father archetype in the previous season. So some individuals will not get access to this richness of life impulse 
and it will they'll become again what we fail to make conscious will remain unconscious and come out in our actions in in warped ways this is what's called shadow inflation or shadow possession by these archetypes i was gonna say something else and it slipped my mind um so Moore and Gillette have interesting names for these possessions. Uh, they can either become what, what they call a high chair tyrant. Um, we'll go through that first. Or, or the weakling prince. So about the high chair tyrant, arrogance, childishness in the negative sense, and irresponsibility, what psychologists call inflation or pathological narcissism. <laughs> like, um, I'm just laughing because again, people get stuck in this um, at higher, at you know, grown or at adult ages. The boss who wants only yes men, who doesn't want to know what's going on. The president who doesn't want to hear his general's advice. The school principal who can't tolerate criticism from his teachers. All are men possessed by the high chair tyrant, riding for a fall. And uh, this is a good example. Yeah, we're, we're getting into the application. So pay attention to these characteristics. And if you notice them in yourselves, maybe this is where, and you're an unhappy, <laughs> if you've made it this far, you're at least doing some self-examination. These videos are to help give you the tools and maybe point you in the right direction. I'm not cocky enough to be able to make the claim that I can actually solve everyone's problems that's viewing this video, but maybe I can at least give you the tools and maybe a direction of where to look. So as we go through these again, pay attention to the, the characteristics and I'll, I'll try and call attention to them when I can. So you just have to ask like, do I have any of this type of behavior in my life? If yes, you may be, um, possessed by this high chair tyrant impulse at least the awareness is better than nothing right so the other side and i'm just sh spitting out a few sentences on these because we have a ton of these to get through and please pick up the book uh king warrior magician lover to read all the all the details i'm i'm telling you what i got from it and again this is just an introduction so the other the other side, so like think about Aristotle's golden mean, right? Let's tangent real quick. Golden mean, right? Courage is in the middle between foolhardiness, like just reckless abandon, and being a coward. And the theory goes in the golden mean, that's where you get courage. The cour courageous person is not somebody who's never afraid, simply the person who's mastered their fear that they feel. So anyone trying to shame you for being fearful is inaccurate unless it potentially tends towards one of those extremes, right? And in the same way, there's um, kind of an inflation, um, like a like the high chair tyrant, or kind of a deflation on the other side, um, the, the weakling. But they're, it's important to, for me to say that they're both dysfunctional. They're both part of the negative side of this archetype. Any of these behaviors qualifies as what's called archetypal frustration in, in that the proper archetypal path has not been made manifest. So hope that bring, brings some clarity. Again, <laughs> trying not to go on too many tangents, but I want I want to make sure I s articulate the proper context as we kind of go through these and I'll be bringing these up again and again so that everyone stays on the same page as best as I can help help it so with the weakling prince quote the boy and later the man who appears to have very little personality no enthusiasm for life and very little initiative this is the boy who needs to be coddled who dictates to those around him by his silence or his whining and complaining hopelessness Everything is too much for him. He revels the dishonesty of, of, of helplessness. 
He revels in the dishonesty of his helplessness, however, in his dagger-like verbal assaults on his siblings, his biting sarcasm against them, and his patent manipulation of their feelings. Moore notes that there is a bipolar aspect to these extremes, meaning at one moment, at one moment, the weakling prince can suddenly flip to the high chair tyrant and vice versa. And my favorite thing, again, I'm going to bring this up in the King lecture, which is coming soon, but Pauly from, from the Rocky movie, I think he's this. There's a great scene where he's bashing a bunch of stuff and, um, Adrian stands up to him and for like the first time we've seen her in the movie and she's just letting him have it. And then he's like, but you're supposed to be nice to me all of a sudden, right? That's a great moment of this flipping. And if you know somebody like Polly, you know, <laughs> Polly, sorry, I was, I, that slipped into me. Um, if you know anybody like that, that's a great example of someone who's possessed highly possessed like this. So, so let's move on about the, to the immature inflations, inflation sides of the uh, magician archetype. So the first one is called, so the, the precocious child, sorry, let's start with the healthy one. The precocious child represents the healthy but immature archetype of the magician. Quote, the precocious child manifests in a boy when he is eager to learn when his mind is quickened, when he wants to share what he is learning with others. There's a glint in his eye and an energy of body and mind that shows he is adventuring in the world of ideas. This boy, and later the man, wants to know the why of everything. We all know this stereotype. It is the origin of our curiosity and our adventurous impulses. In a man, it keeps his sense of wonder and curiosity alive, stimulates his intellect, and moves him in the direction of the mature magician. So on the shadow side, on the one hand, we have the know-it-all trickster. This is uh, an immature masculine that plays tricks of a more or less serious nature in one's own life and on others. He is an expert on creating appearances and then selling us on those appearances. He's always looking for a sucker. He's a manipulator. It's an aspect of a boy or man that enjoys intimidating others and de uh, deprecates those who don't know what he knows or holds opinions that differ from his. Sounds like the academic, right? The, in the bad way. Why we don't like academics. He is, in psychological language, passive-aggressive. The trickster causes a boy and later a man to have an authority problem. He will readily believe that all men in power are corrupt or abusive. The know-it-all trickster has no heroes because to have heroes is to admire others. We can only admire others if we have a sense of our own worthiness and a developing sense of security about our own creative energies. Now, on the other side, we have the dummy who lacks personality, vigor, and creativity. He seems unresponsive and dull. In addition, he lacks a sense of humor and frequently seems to miss the point of jokes. The dummy's ineptitude, however, is frequently less than honest. He may grasp far more than he shows, and his dunce-like behavior may mask a hidden grandiosity that feels itself too important, as well as too vulnerable, to come into the world. Um... Let me know in the comments if y'all can think of uh, like a character in a movie or somebody you may know who fits these. Um, so let's move on to the immature lover archetypes. We'll start with the Oedipal child. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> We're sorry. Again, the healthy uh, immature lover archetype and immature just meaning not developed, not in the negative way, right? In the negative ways they're manifest i'm, I'm going to try and use the words inflations or deflations or shadow possessions so the oedipal child is the healthy immature lover archetype he is passionate and has a sense of wonder and a deep appreciation for connectedness when he, with his inner depths with others and with all things 
He is warm, related, and affectionate. He also expresses through his experience in connectedness to the mother the origins of what we call spirituality. And one of the shadow sides here is the mama's boy. <laughs> um, so, quote, tied to mama's apron strings. He often gets caught up in chasing the beautiful, the poignant, the yearning for union with the mother in the archetypal sense, from one woman to another. Here we have the Don Juan syndrome. He does not want to do what it takes to actually have union with a mortal woman and deal with all the complex feelings involved in an intimate relationship. He does not want to take responsibility. Now I want to pause here for just a brief moment and say that Moore and Gillette are writing in like the, the, the mid to late 80s. This, this, wor this work published in the early 90s, mid 90s, but meaning that they were doing their research for years prior to that. The cultural landscape between men and women has changed dramatically even since then. So they may, um, there may be some anachronistic, <laughs> it's funny how time flies, um, faster and faster it seems like, but there may be some uh, anachronistic attitudes that may slip through. If I tried to unpack every single one, we I wouldn't get anything done here. Just know that that's the context that they're coming from. And uh, we talked about the puer eternus, the puer eternus, which is kind of um, like a never never land, like um, remaining boys forever, and the the lost boys, like just staying in that childlike state. Um, it's kind of a perverse, morbid innocence. Um, that's kind of, and it, the Don Juan syndrome to me also, and I, I think I'm kind of guilty of this somewhat. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the ladies now. The, uh, but like I'm promiscuous in terms of like ideas and projects. Like I want to do everything. I want to make origami. I want to like build a house on water, like, like a plant house, like a permaculture, like, but with like Wi-Fi and technology and like, I want to learn about that stuff. I want to learn about like raising earthworms and farming, but also learning how to sing. And, and all, like, I have all these like crazy interests. I want to learn like C, uh, Metal Gear Solid style CQC and, and all that stuff. Um, so I'm very like all over the place. Um, so I can kind of identify with this somewhat. Um, so on the other Shadow side, we have the dreamer. The dreamer causes a boy to feel isolated and cut off from all human relationships. Relationships are, are with intangible things and with the world of the imagination within him. Okay, this might be me. <laughs> um, as a consequence, while other children are playing, he may sit on a rock dreaming his dreams. I, I do this all the time right now. Uh, <laughs> often his dreams tend to be melancholy. Oh, that, that doesn't fit. On the one hand, or, or highly idyllic and ethereal on the other. Okay, so neither of those fit me too well. His grandiosity in seeking to possess the mother lies hidden under the dreamer's depression. Okay, so maybe part of that. A little bit of that. So let's move on to the warrior. The healthy but immature warrior archetype is the hero. All right, so they say, they by meaning the authors, say, it is generally assumed that the heroic approach to life or to a task is the noblest, but this is only partly true. The hero is, in fact, only an advanced form of boy psychology, the most advanced form, the peak, actually, of the masculine energies of the boy, the archetype that characterizes the best in the adolescent stage of development. Yet, it is immature, and when it is carried over into adulthood as the governing archetype, it blocks men from full maturity. It's fascinating uh, to me. So, like, the divine child um, is the most fundamental, but 
um, the the hero, the warrior impulse in the immature like boy or adolescent is actually the most advanced immature archetype. Like for that to awaken is a big deal. Um, and I don't I don't have it in my notes here, but I believe that uh, later we'll see when we cover the warrior archetype that the warrior was actually thought to be the like the, the connection to the warrior archetype is actually thought to be the primitive impulse to spirituality. I know we talked about spirituality in the lover arc, uh, the uh, Oedipal child and and uh, for the lover, the immature lover archetypes. But think about like a warrior trance, right? Or you're in a flow state. You're working really hard, but time is just flying by and you're in that, what they call the zone of proximal development. Like you're sufficiently challenged to have market improvements, you know? That's a that's a beautiful thing. Almost a spiritual thing, right? Think about the Northman, that think about the movie, right? They go into that berserker trance. So as an immature energy, this is actually what the authors claim this is a very this is the most advanced immature form in the boy. So let's talk about its shadow possessions, its uh, inflations. The boy or man, un, or sorry, sorry, we're talking about, they call it the grandstander bully. The boy or man under the power of the bully intends to impress others. His strategies are designed to proclaim his superiority and his right to dominate those around him. He is a loner. He's the soldier who takes unnecessary risks in combat. And if he's in a position of leadership, requires the same of his men. We are, <laughs> it sounds like, Overwatch DPS players. We are seldom told what happens once the hero has slain the dragon and married the princess, because the hero, as an archetype, doesn't know what to do with the princess once he's won her. He is unable to acknowledge his own limitations. And Moore actually cites Maverick from Top Gun, the original. Remember the time period they're writing in? Late 80s, early 90s-ish. The reckless flying which endangers his teammates and has an inflated sense of his own importance. So, the other side of the hero is the coward, shows an extreme reluctance to stand up for himself in physical confrontations. He will usually run away from a fight, perhaps excusing himself by claiming that it's more manly to walk away, but he will feel wretched in spite of his excuses. It is not only physical fights he will avoid, however. He will allow himself to be bullied emotionally and intellectually as well. As well. So Moore explains that the hero serves the evolutionary adaptation mobilizing the boy's delicate ego structures to enable him to break with the mother archetype at the end of boyhood and to face the difficult life, difficult tasks life is bringing, uh, bringing to him. This resonates with what we covered last season with Dr. Anthony Stevens when, when he explains that girls relate to their mother via identification while boys identify with her through separation. An additional requirement is made on men to forge their own separate identity away from the mother. This is of paramount importance to, to all this. I, go check out those, those season one um, videos. So, um, the divine child, more the authors say, the divine child naturally gives rise to the edible child. Together, they form the nucleus of what will be beautiful, energetic, related, warm, caring, and spiritual in a man. The boy's ego needs the precocious child's perceptiveness to help it to distinguish itself from these energies. And all three give rise to the hero, which breaks free of the domination of the feminine unconscious and establishes the boy's identity as a separate individual. The hero prepares the boy to become a man. So there's a lot more on this. We're out of time. Please join me in the next videos in the series and I'll see you all in the next one. Again, find examples. Let me know in the comments below.
See you all later. Bye-bye.